here with us today. We have Jared Brown returning to us to impart all of his expertise. And I think that this topic in particular is so important for so many special needs mamas and so many adoptive mamas. And so I'm really excited to dive in today. We're talking about theory of mind deficits and then how like stealing and property and all of that confusion for our kiddos really comes into play, which I'm fascinated about. I think that we've all struggled with this, of having children who do this and not really understanding. How do you not understand that you're stealing something right now? So I'm excited to dive in. Jared, welcome back. Hi, Laura. Thanks for having me. Honored to be here. Yeah. Can we jump right into theory of mind deficits? Because I I had never heard of this terminology before I met you. Yeah, it's a it's a huge topic that people don't realize how important it is. And I say it's huge because if you just go online and Google theory of mind, there's been thousands of studies written on this topic within the context of so many different disorders. A big chunk of it comes out of the autism world, but there are more and more studies that have looked at this within the context of everything you can possibly imagine, including fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So theory of mind is a component of perspective taking. There's components of empathy wrapped up into it as well. So when we have good theory of mind, when it's doing what it's supposed to and it works properly and we have an experience in utero trauma or early childhood trauma or brain damage, typically, hopefully it works better. So we're in a better position to understand the internal mental states of other people. So people with good theory of mind can understand other people's belief systems, their desires, their motivations, their intentions even their misconceptions. It has a lot to do with understanding false belief states as well. And playing make-believe as a kid, knowing that make-believe is make-believe and it's not real. People with theory of mind deficits sometimes can have a hard time distinguishing between make-believe and what's real. It can lead to deficits in perspective taking. So if someone has perspective taking deficits, it can absolutely get in the way of effective social interactions. It can get in the way of a relationship. So if a child goes to school, has theory of mind deficits, a lot of times they may come off as more distracted or bored or disinterested, and they could come off very one-sided. And as they get older, it could look like they're really cold and callous and aloof, and it's me, 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 and they never think about other people's feelings. You can about imagine how that probably goes in a K through 12 environment. A lot of these kids, as they get older, probably are going to get bullied more. They're going to start thinking there might be something wrong with me. So they might deal with higher levels of shame. Teachers may misinterpret this as that child is just being selfish or just not caring about school when in fact it could be a brain-based issue. Theory of mind deficits can absolutely impact relationship quality. How someone gets along in a group, maybe they're on a sports team, it can impact how they get along with other people on their team. As they get a job, if they have theory of mind deficits, a lot of times it could contribute to issues in the workplace. So it can impact all areas of functioning. Appropriate classroom behavior is impacted by theory of mind deficits, how you get along with your peers, and it doesn't matter if it's a child or adult, this can impact peer relationships. It can absolutely get in the way of comprehending and predicting other people's behavior, so basically like mind reading. It gets in the way of comprehending stories, so children with theory of mind deficits reading stories, playing the make-believe stuff, they can get things mixed up and have a hard time kind of distinguishing between what's real, what's not. It gets in the, it's a critical component of problem solving, critical thinking. And interestingly, this is where I do a lot of work in, it can absolutely contribute to someone having a very difficult time detecting deception in other people. So this is where it gets into vulnerability and victimization. So as that child gets older, 
and has theory of mind deficits, they may not pick up on the fact that these other people are taking advantage of them. This can get in the way when someone's online and not being able to connect the dots that that other person online might just be saying the things that that person wants to hear to be able to get money from them. I've dealt with that many times. There's lots of issues. It gets in the way of empathy. So it can look like empathy deficits on the surface. It can absolutely impact that person's ability to hold a meaningful conversation with another person. If you can't maintain a meaningful conversation with another person, it kind of gets, it gets more difficult to find and maintain healthy friends. So this can get in the way of friendship making. So huge, huge thing. And it absolutely gets in the way of just all aspects of sociality. So we need to be aware of that. Many things can impact theory of mind. Kids with trauma histories, oftentimes may deal with this. People with FASD, near pretty much everyone with autism has this. Kids that have maybe a head trauma from something can have this. Theory of mind is impacted by the development of language, social skills, executive functioning capabilities, academic achievement, and even sensitivity to criticism. So you can't just say the child has theory of mind deficits. Maybe they do, but then peel back the layers. Are they also dealing with some language or communication problems? Are they dealing with those executive function impairments? And if you have a child with special needs who has a neurodevelopmental disorder, they have executive function impairments. That's the boss of the brain, the CEO of the brain. Good theory of mind when it's working properly plays a critical role in moral decision-making, moral judgment, in reasoning. This is where it starts coming into play with like criminal behavior, not understanding ownership, theft, those kind of things. So if someone doesn't understand other people's perspectives, they may not understand ownership. They may not grasp that concept that I go to a friend's house and I see something laying on the counter. That doesn't mean it's mine because no one else is like holding it right now. Their brain may not go there and just think, oh, it's just sitting there. Okay, that's probably mine then. They're not connecting the dots here. That is one component of if you are working with someone that has a history of like theft or just really not grasping the concept of ownership, look at theory of mind. There's all kinds of other things you want to take into account, but theory of mind is one thing. I'll talk about some of those other things in a minute, but Laura, do, any, any thoughts on theory of mind? Do you see this all the time, even though you may have not heard the term? Yeah. Every child of mine, everything you said, I was like, oh, yeah. All three of mine with FASD and then our little buddy with autism too. I just, yes, all yeah. of this makes so much sense to me. What well, doesn't make so much sense to me, but like it's a I fascinating to topic. <laughs> yes. I'm, so, yeah, I guess I'm struggling with like, is there even, is there hope for these things? Because there hope there's all kinds, yeah, there's training, there's different things we can do, but just being aware of the deficits, the red flag indicators of this. Other deficits you might want to be on the lookout for when someone has theory of mind deficits is they don't know how to use gestures appropriately or nonverbals. That's a big thing you want to be aware of. They may come off indifferent to other people's opinions of them. So they just come off kind of stoic or flat or aloof in some cases. And then you might see this lack of restraint or ex really displaying inappropriate affect where the affect just doesn't match up to the situation at hand. Crying at times that just don't make sense, laughing at times that seem inappropriate. I, I study like criminality a lot. And you hear these cases of these folks in jail or prison or in the courts just start laughing about the circumstance they're in. My mind goes to, are they, is there some theory of mind deficits here at play as well? Empathy problems? I, I, I don't know, but people just, just don't connect the dots that they're in some serious trouble here. So something to think about. If your child or adult has a long standing history of just not understanding unwritten social rules. Like you don't go up to strangers and ask them how much they weigh, how much money you make, or 
really close talkers who don't understand body space and awareness. These are all red flag indicators of theory mind deficits, along with there's probably other things going on as well, because theory of mind falls under the umbrella of social cognition. Social cognition is the umbrella term for how we as humans perceive and process and interpret information in the social arena. And under the umbrella of social cognition, theory of mind is one component, but so is empathy, so is emotional recognition, so is group behavior, as well as emotional intelligence, just to name a few. Each one of those is a talk in and of itself, but theory of mind is one component that falls under the umbrella of social cognition. And if, in my experience, everyone with autism, well, obviously, if someone's diagnosed with autism, they're always going to have the social communication deficits. I don't know anyone with FASD that I've worked with or have consulted on cases where they don't have social limitations of some sort, where they're probably dealing with some deficits in the area of social cognition. So it's a critical component to understanding human behavior. And if you can understand this, then you're in a much better position to really tailor your approaches, getting the person set up with the right professionals to tackle these problems. And these are problems because if they have these issues and they go through life, friendship making, holding a job, working in a group, intimacy deficits, interpersonal competence, getting in and out of just crazy relationships, domestic violence and enmeshment issues. These are all things I've consulted on as the person gets older, if these things don't get under control. And unfortunately not to scare anyone too, but I do a lot of work in the area of inappropriate sexual behavior from a consultation lens. This is a factor that plays into some cases of someone engaging in sex-related crimes or inappropriate behavior, as well as lying and cheating and stealing, to name a few. And unfortunately, we know from the research that people with FASD, particularly folks that have undiagnosed and are not in an environment, in a family where there's a lot of oversight and love and attachment, a lot of these kids, without the structure and support as they get older, may start displaying more externalizing behavioral problems where it could bring that person into contact with the criminal justice system for a variety of reasons. So this is one topic of many you have to understand in my opinion. And I'll talk about some of those other layers too when we talk about theft and ownership, but theory of mind's a big one. How do you even begin to find somebody who's knowledgeable in this? Like you said, working with a professional who understands this. Yeah. How would I search for a professional who understands this that can help me with tools and training and all the things that I need to know about this? I know that there are few people that study this, in my opinion, that I've found. I, I, I give lots of talks on this and actually I've got a handful of podcasts talking about this as well. Share my email with folks. I can give them some general tips and some handouts and resources in terms of finding someone that's truly competent in this. Going to the research literature, looking at the authors, looking at the people who have written books on this, going on YouTube, looking at folks that have given lectures on this, that's a good starting point. The people that do do a lot of work in this, do they understand FASD? That's the question too, a lot of them know. A lot of these folks will understand autism. So when you're working with autism specialists, that's a good starting point as well. Some autism specialists will know about this and some might have never heard the term, but they work with people that are displaying these behaviors day in and day out. Finding a social skills group and if they can incorporate theory of mind training and interventions into that, it's gonna be wonderful. Using other search terms like perspective taking would be helpful. Empathy, mind reading is a term you'd wanna be aware of. Something called mentalization. There's actually mentalization-based therapy. That is a wonderful intervention that is out there. It's not necessarily for FASD, but if you study theory of mind, you'd probably wanna understand the topic of mentalization. They're almost the same, but they, there's different groups of researchers that study both. 
mentalization based therapy, I believe, was developed originally for people with borderline personality disorder who have these emotional intensity problems. But it's been tailored for other audiences. So mentalization would be another topic to be aware of. What would be the flyover view of a definition of mentalization therapy? Working on increasing emotional awareness, perspective taking, understanding internal mental states of others and ourselves too. So for these people that are dealing with these deficits, it's not only not understanding the, the emotional states or the mental states of other people, but do they understand their own emotional states? And I've consulted on numerous cases where the person may have had a long history of just tons of internal distress. Maybe they've turned to self-injurious behavior. Maybe they've turned to emotional eating or elopement behavior. I've consulted on the cases with group homes where the person, when they become so emotionally overwhelmed, they jump out of a moving car. They run away from their group home. These are all cases I've consulted on. They don't understand their emotional state a lot of times. So they're dealing with all this internal distress, teaching them coping skills, how to manage that distress more. Distress tolerance would be something to learn about. Because when people get outside their window of tolerance for, for their distress, and if the person doesn't understand how to manage their own emotional state, all this negative energy keeps going in their body and eventually just spills over. And sometimes it can spill over into somatic symptoms, which is basically like headaches, stomach aches, chest pain, back pain. The child comes to you and says, my heart's racing so much. I think I'm having a heart attack. You go to the emergency room. Doctor can't find anything wrong. They run all the tests. It might be somatic symptoms where all this negative emotional mood state goes into their body and they don't know how to get it out by naming their emotions. So teaching them how to name their emotions, label their emotions to make sense of it using feelings charts. Some of the cases I've consulted on, they've done well working with like an art therapist, a play therapist, a music therapist. I can think of a couple cases where the individual worked with like equine assisted therapy or animal assisted therapy. All of these things are really good to help people connect the dots with their emotions, but they can also be very helpful in processing trauma and improving attachment as well. So lots of things we can do about this. Music has been very helpful in some of the cases I've worked on where the person can't seem to describe their emotions well, but when they start listening to music or watching a movie, incorporating that into what you do might be helpful as well. Making things visual as well. So not just saying, hey, it looks like you feel sad today. What does that mean truly to someone with an FASD brain? That's kind of an abstract concept. Connect the dots. This is what sadness looks like. Here's a feelings chart showing them a video of someone that looks sad. Okay, when you feel sad, explain to me what you're feeling in your body as well. So those are some things to think about. Okay, I love that. Because that's a lot of what, it's a lot of what me and my counselor work on, right? Where do you feel that in your body? Um, yeah, I love that. And I have a great feelings chart that I can link down at the bottom here too, just in case you don't have one that you love already. Okay, I want to I want to move transition into the the thievery of this whole this whole piece that I'm just I'm so desperately want to understand. So basically, the theft and ownership component. So there's not a lot of research out there on FASD and theft, but there's a few studies that talk about theft and ownership issues may be more common in this population. And the reasons for that are many and varied, and they can differ from child to child, from adult to adult. But some of the common themes that come up. Well, I have, I have a question because it's not just FASD kids, right? It's everyone with theory of mind. Not everyone with theory of mind issues, but with those deficits, do they fall into this category as well? So yeah, I mean, awesome. it, it could apply to someone with any kind of neurodevelopmental disorder. So if you have a child or an adult with a neurodevelopmental disorder and they have a history of theft, 
these can all be variables you'd want to take into account. None of these explain it 100%. It's usually a layer here, but impulse control issues is something to be aware of. So if someone has impulse control issues, that's a self-regulation, self-control debt, deficit. Those are rooted in executive functioning impairments. It could be that inability to delay gratification where they just don't understand the concept of waiting and being patient. On the extreme end of things, if someone has impulse control issues, sometimes they might have a longer history of violence, anger, aggression. They could have a longer history of like drug and alcohol problems, gambling, addiction issues, self-injurious behavior, unplanned pregnancies, unfortunately, in some cases too, with, with, with this is talked about. Look at their eating habits. If they have a tendency to go to the buffet and you have five or 10 plates, that's an impulse control problem. Everything I'm saying is supported in the literature, but everything I'm saying too is things I have professionally observed in cases. If someone's on probation and they have multiple probation violations, they can't ever hold a job, they get a paycheck and they spend all their money within a, a few minutes to an hour and now they have no money left over to pay their bills. These are all things kind of rooted in impulse control issues. We have prison systems built in this country for people with impulse control problems. So helping people learn how to pause and reflect and think through things, you're gonna live longer. You're probably gonna be less likely to go to jail. You're probably gonna be more likely to maintain appropriate body weight. You're probably gonna be more likely to have more healthy relationships. So self-control, executive functioning interventions. These are all really good things for any human being. Other variables is the fact that some people with these, a lot of people with these disorders also deal with abstract thinking deficits where they have a hard time connecting the dots. Cause and effect, planning for the future, seeing the gray in things not being able to see the forest through the trees. So concrete thinking comes into this. Someone sees something laying somewhere, like they see a piece of property or $20 laying somewhere or a bike just sitting outside someone's house they walk by. Their brain may not go there that, that, that maybe doesn't belong to me. If I take this, what happens to me tomorrow? I could have the police knocking at my door. I could be going to court. They're not connecting the dots. So concrete thinkers, those are some things to be aware of. So being aware too, that some of these individuals may not pick up on these invisible rules of legal ownership. What does that truly mean when you're teaching ownership to someone with these deficits? Make it concrete, make it visual, because there's a lot of invisible rules with all of these things. We need to be aware. Problem solving deficits are sometimes talked about as well. So we need to be aware when they're dealing with these kind of problems. A lot of times they probably deal with some level of problem solving deficits. Other things that I consistently hear from professionals and caregivers I consult with, especially with people with FASD, the concept of time and money can be tricky. Those are abstract reasoning deficits as well. So a lot of times I hear this mathematics can be very difficult for someone with FASD. Managing money, I just consulted on a case last week where the person cannot tell time. If it's on like a, a clock on the wall, they have to have some sort of digital time where it says like 1158 rather than the little hand on it. Being aware too, we have to understand executive function when we're talking about that. Executive function, CEO of the brain, it guides adaptive day-to-day -day behavior. It's a higher order cognitive process. And under the umbrella of executive function is something called working memory. Inhibition, which is our internal parking brake, which has a lot to do with self-regulation. And cognitive flexibility are the big three. Cognitive flexibility is people that can go with the flow, they're flexible, change is okay, they just kind of go with it. Cognitive inflexibility would be someone that's very rigid, can't handle change, they just completely have a meltdown if their routine changes. And we know from 
working with people with neurodevelopmental disorders, they do best with structure, consistency, and predictability. Without that, a lot of times it can trigger more stress. So we need to be aware of that topic as well. And impairments in emotional regulation need to be considered. So if someone does not know how to manage their emotional mood state, that's a factor. And for some people with the theft and ownership issues, part of it could be rooted in social skill impairment, but also memory problems. If the person has a memory issue, maybe they, they forgot about what they learned previously about ownership and the importance of not taking things that don't belong to you. And unfortunately, too, we need to consider the comorbidities. So are there any co-occurring disabilities, deficits, or disorders at play? So for example, as, as that person gets older, do they have a drug or alcohol problem or a serious mental health challenge at play as well? Or did that child grow up in a home where they observed theft by a caregiver as well, where they now think it's okay. So we need to be aware of what's going on in that family of origin as well. And for some of these individuals, it could be rooted in poor boundaries, confusion, all of these things are talked about in this literature. And two other things I would talk about too when we study this, confabulation, false memory creation, maybe someone didn't steal, but their brain said, yeah, I did steal. Now they report themselves and they get in trouble and they didn't steal anything. They overheard a conversation or they saw something on TV and they thought they were, that was a cool thing to do. And now they're reporting they did all these elaborate thefts in the neighborhood when in fact, absolutely they didn't. They could be confabulating false memory creation. And then their level of gullibility. Maybe they're a scapegoat and they're in a group of friends where those friends take advantage of that person and they just say, you should go take that. The gullibility needs to be taken into account. So those are all the variables in a nutshell, if you were to go through the FASD and theft literature, but all of that can apply to really any human being, especially with special needs as well. Yeah. And when we're going through like adoption training and stuff like that, they often talk about theft as being part of that. Is that just a overall that could apply to anyone in adoption or is that more like well, wow, it's different by case and there's so many factors and therefore we don't know okay you could have kids in in the adoption arena kids with a neurodevelopmental disorder who absolutely never ever steal and for some people on the autism spectrum there's plenty of research that talks about some kids with autism follow rules like nobody else as well. So they absolutely will not do anything to break the law. And if they saw something, they would report it right away. So it's so individualized because some kids with FASD may be in a home where they had tons and tons of love and support in early interventions. And you have another child in their home, chaos, abuse, trauma. On top of the FASD, they're exposed to meth, cocaine, they have all kinds of problematic friends. I mean, it's so individualized, but the variables I shared today, learning about all them, even if it's not theft related, if you want to learn about it within the context of improving social skills, friendship making, or even to improve the use of humor among the individual, this all applies to so many things. And I'll leave it on a positive note in terms of promoting these things, anything you can do to promote healthy cognitive development, so brain development, nutrition, exercise, good sleep, promoting appropriate social emotional development, so focusing on targeting social skills and emotional health, targeting their language and communication abilities, so maybe they have some deficits, working with a speech language communication pathologist might be helpful, Promoting healthy pretend play early on in life with maybe like a qualified art therapist or play therapist could be helpful. And there's different kinds of programs you can find online too in workbooks. On Theory of Mind, none of them are tailored to FASD per se, but quite a few seem to be tailored toward autism. But you can just go online and type in Theory of Mind workbooks. You can find all kinds of stuff. Good videos on YouTube. Doing think alouds doing thought bubble training, social stories, 
these are all kinds of interventions you can find handouts on. There's a some guidebooks for parents. I think there's a guidebook called Talkability. Don't quote me on that. I think it's called Talkability. And you can type that in. There's you can do role playing activities that can be helpful. Doing coaching, modeling, teaching, role playing, and then really promoting creative dramatics as well. Again, infusing maybe art based approaches, music, those kind of things might be helpful as well. If you're sitting at the dinner table with your family, put down the gadgets and just talk. That's promoting theory of mind. You just talk and share and listen and attunement and eye contact and turn taking. These are all promoting empathy. It's promoting theory of mind. It's promoting perspective taking. And I guess one last thing I'll say, Laura, I apologize. Anytime we can help these children and teenagers and adults learn how to understand, interpret, process, and perceive emotions, we're going to be in a much better position. Focusing on emotional intelligence and social intelligence skills can be helpful. Enhancing executive function. You can find executive function coaches online. I don't know how many specialize in FASD, but finding an executive function coach might be something to try as well. And then last but not least, teaching self-control, self-discipline, patience, self-monitoring, self-management, and even metacognition training. A million things we can do to help these kids. It's just knowing these topics. It's overwhelming when you hear it at first, but once you understand it, it opens the door to so many possibilities in my opinion. Yeah, I can't wait to dive in further. I have taken a ton of notes and I feel like the whole time I was just kind of chuckling because everything you said, I was like, oh, that's my kid. Oh, that's my kid. <laughs> it all felt so familiar to me. Um, thank you. My goodness, thank you. You're welcome. I feel like I've learned so much today. I'm hoping that everyone out there learned so much too. And I probably should have prefaced this whole thing by you need to grab a pen and paper and maybe go back and listen to it again and grab a pen and paper. Um, yeah, I'm I'm just kind of blown away. Is there a, like a book? So most of us are busy mamas. And so I'm like, is there like a book that we could get on this? It would be kind of your top choice where it's not, I, I need something that's yeah. not petty and medical. I need it to be pretty simple for no. my tired brain, you know? The easiest thing to do, I think, share my email. I put together a little cheat sheet with a lot of these things in there. That would be a starting point. In terms of a book, there needs to be some authors out there that tailor books that incorporate all of these things into it for FASD as well, in my opinion. Okay. And a lot of this may come up, like, there's just not a lot of, like, mental health folks that specialize this or criminal justice. It seems like some of the folks that specialize in this might come more out of the the educational arena, which is very, very important. But all of the professionals who interact with someone that has these deficits, learning about this is a foundational topic, in my opinion. It's not a secondary topic, it's an absolute foundation. I just, I'm sure that you feel the same way too. I'm like, I wish that people would see how much this could change our whole society. Like if, yeah. We were to educate I mean, ourselves on it and put in supports for it. And my goodness. We have improved perspective taking. We like each other better. We're happier. We're healthier. We probably, it can probably prevent burnout on your job. It can improve your relationship with your spouse and kids. And poor perspective taking can erode any kind of relationship, one on one or in any kind of group. So it has implications for human functioning in every facet of life you can imagine. Okay. Well, Jared, I know you're going to be back with us to share more of your wisdom, and I'm really grateful for it. I really can't wait. Appreciate it. Thank you. Type up all these notes for everybody. Um, Y'all, thank you for joining us again today. Jared, thank you for joining us and for imparting your wisdom. So grateful for you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Likewise, great work you're doing.